are we're doing whiskey tasting and everyone loves whiskey on this this event tonight that I thought we should just talk about making a nice old fashioned um, taking a toast and that'll be it. Wonderful. Um, please use the um, chat if uh, you have any questions or need follow up. I'm hoping everybody has the um, kits that were sent out. I believe everyone does. If not, just uh, let us know in the chat and we can make sure we get those to you after this. But um, with that, so we have three drinks that we're going to be making. Um, I'll quick go into, as I stated, this is recorded. We'll send out the slide uh, material afterwards. So really, this is all about, um, you know, obviously learning a little bit and having some fun before the holidays. So I hope everybody um, gets some knowledge out of this and also enjoys the presentation on um, whiskey. So with that, I'll just quick finish a little bit about who um, Crossfell is, and then I'll have Tiffany uh, start with the first drink. So I will advance. Um, as I was stating, Crossville, um, we're based out of Dallas. We have offices in EMEA and um, our managed service practice is out of um, Spain. So we cover on these four main pillars and really um, Crossville started around the uh, application development uh, way back when. Uh, we have um, became a Red Hat Apex partner in 2017. So we have um, knowledge in the whole portfolio to be able to help and deliver. Tonight, we're going to focus on one of our pillars around automation. I think everybody knows why automation is important. Try to reduce uh, the repetitive tasks and you know free up your valuable resources to do innovative things. We help customers around the hybrid cloud journey. Um, and as I uh, mentioned, uh, around the application development, we have a lot of experience in that. Lastly, um, for that day two operation, uh, as customers run through this journey, um, there's a lot to know. And so sometimes leveraging a managed service helps customers alleviate uh, adoption, right? So faster adoption. So with that, I will turn it to um, over to Tiffany and maybe we'll make our first uh, drink of the evening. And I will be right back. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. Thanks so much. And everyone that's tuned in, you know, I have to always start these virtual chats um, when you're you're working along with spirits and booze being around. I don't know how long this will last, so I just want to like uplift this exciting moment that we're going to be covering some really cool, some really cool things from the team um, and all the hard work you all are doing. But we get a chance to make a toast to it. We get a chance to have a sip of it. Um, I was just talking with my team shortly ago, and and I know everyone's gotten their kit except maybe one or two. FedEx was just it was one of those times we happen to have this 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 class right um, during the holidays. So I definitely apologize um, for those that did not get their kit, but I hope that later on you can enjoy what we sent you um, without me. I'm gonna hate that I'm not gonna be there, but I'm sure you're gonna enjoy it. So what we did was a nice a nice whiskey tasting. Um, a nice uh, flavor profile um, and education course of what whiskey really is. And I often get asked as a guru, cocktail guru, we get often asked, what's the difference between, what's the difference between whiskey um, and Irish whiskey or whiskey and bourbon or whiskey and scotch? And what are those, what are, what's that conversation about? So really, I just want to just break it down really easy that um, whiskey is a big umbrella. Um, it's, it's all whiskey. But there's some branches that come off of that that are different styles of the whiskey. And to be a whiskey, that means there's some kind of um, mash bill, some kind of cereal. When I say cereal, I mean like oat and rye or, or, or corn, um, um, all kinds of different ingredients that are grown from the ground to go into fermentation and distillation. And we won't go too heavy on fermentation and fermentation and distillation is, but really it's just taking the detail of what a, a byproduct can be and what the yeast is added. Um, there's a an oatmeal of sorts that's created. And then after that, we have to just cut that with water. We have to bring that to some steam um, and cut that and then bring it on into distillation. Um, and then we get into a, a, a bottling barrel situation. And what makes whiskey great, which we love about whiskey is that it sits in a barrel and it could sit in a barrel anywhere from three months until 
Gosh, I've seen 75 to 80 years before and any whiskey drinkers on with me definitely have seen some of our favorite whiskeys that have been sipped in, in into years and years. And yes, whiskey is one of those things where the older it gets, the better it tastes. So um, we want to just blend in some great whiskey profiles for you. We've got everything from a bourbon to a rye to an Irish whiskey, which all have different profiles, but we get a chance to taste them. Now, we're not going to make cocktails out of everything, but I do want to taste some things. And then once we taste what we like, hopefully you want to just um, join me with a nice um, uh, old fashioned of sorts. Um, so to start off, we've got our nice um, bourbon, start off with straight Kentucky bourbon. We love a nice mini. They go great into the pockets if need be. And I don't want to bring out our, our youth, but we know what a whole mini is all about. So this is a Kentucky straight bourbon. Bourbon at one point was only allocated in Kentucky. Um, and, and, and then things changed around 2007 and 8, where the surrounding states wanted to also make great profiles like that. So if you are sipping with me, we just want to just open up that small bottle and give it a small pour quarter of an ounce into the glass. My team and I sent you a nice Glen Karen, and that's that nice whiskey glass there. I'm not using my Glen Karen until the very end because I have to, a few things to show you. But the Glen Karen glass is the proper whiskey glass. Notice it's elongated. It has a deep barrel to the bottom and a narrow nose to the top so that we can give it a nice whiff, but also let it have some room to aerate. Similar to wine, my friends, yet Whiskey is a spirit, so there is a bit of ethanol inside, so we need to save those nose hairs, so we don't want to get too deep and put our snouser in there. We want to be able just to take a nice sniff, and the best way to take a sniff of whiskey is to inhale with your mouth open and take a nice inhale. So if you are sipping with me, you poured out that straight whiskey, you want to just take an inhale without your whole snouser because we need that nose later and see if you catch anything. Now, often when we're sipping spirits, you don't catch much. You just kind of get booze. You get straight alcohol. But I'll talk you through some nuances here that you're hopefully, hopefully getting some corn. And that's what makes bourbon bourbon. To be classified as a bourbon, it needs to be 51% corn. And the rest, the 49% can be what it may be. So give that a nice sniff there. And inhale. We don't need to look too long for legs like we do wine. And when we're looking at that side, we're looking to see if the drips um, are, are short or long. And that will be sugar content. So we'll kind of see what's happening here. Looking at the color, it looks nice and light, straight Kentucky, and possibly to the two to four year um, age range. When I say age range, sitting in there for um, about four years in a barrel. Do so nice Tiffany does... Does the glass change the taste? I know sometimes with wine, the different wine glasses really change the taste. Does that um, affect the taste of whiskey and bourbon? Yeah, great question, Mike. Yeah, that's absolutely what's happening in the glass. The glass is giving you that space. Um, like we see a carafe when it comes to wine or a red wine glass versus a white wine glass. We're looking for that spirit to expand. It's been sitting in a bottle for goodness gracious some time. It's been sitting in a barrel for some time. So when it sees air, it wants to stretch like we do in the morning. It wants to just wake up a bit and be what it started off with. It wants to just go, woo, okay, now what can I be? And air does that. And so moving it around the glass again, I'm sipping in another whiskey style of glass. I'll do our Glen Karen on our third, our second or third glass. But it's getting the air. So using your Glen Karen is super fun. Any collectors out there, I suggest totally buying a couple of Glen Karens. You want to have a couple of tastings, maybe 12, not pushing it, but a few there so that your whiskey can wake up and get a good yaw in there. And as it barrels in, just like wine, it'll barrel into the nose so that you can inhale. So we'll just give it a, a nice smell. Our first sip, believe it or not, our first sip doesn't really count. Our first sip, literally, and, and we'll do it later on, and we'll have to go through this detail this detailed moment, but the first sip is really just to coat the mouth. You've had coffee or tea, you've had lunch, maybe some early dinner, maybe you had some snacks that we sent you, um, but we want to clean the mouth, and we clean the mouth with the first sip, and we swallow. And then the next sip is when we take on the nuance of the bourbon or the spirit, the whiskey, 
And then um, we start to talk about what's happening. So first tip goes in, small. Coating it like mouthwash. Taking away our coffee and tea from the earlier meeting. <laughs> Pulling it back. Taking a breath. Yes, it's going to be warm. That is alcohol. That's usually an 80 to 100 proof. So you want to get that cool off there. And then the second sip, we can have a moment to think about it. Same coat. Let me let that just kind of go down the throat nice and slow. Warm stuff, hot stuff. I'm here in Atlanta. It's almost seven o'clock. It's about that time. But yes, this is getting me ready to go. My chest is a bit warm. But there's some things happening in my cheeks. And no, you don't taste corn. We talk about tequila, we say agave. And we talk about rum, we say sugar cane. But when we drink bourbon, we don't say, oh my God, I get that corn. You never really say that. But you are getting this flavor profile, maybe some brown sugar, maybe a light bit of oak. And that's the oak, of course, that's the girl that it's been sitting in. Um, I'm sure I have some wine tasters here and our mind connects with our palate instantly. So I'm sure what I say, you'll go, oh my goodness. Or maybe you can give me the feedback. I can see the, the chat here, but um, maybe some applewood or some mesquite. Maybe it's wanting some barbecue. Um, you're just getting like, I, I got lots of caramel and lots of butterscotch coming through. But that's what bourbon does. It's the sweeter side. And if I have any scotch drinkers on here with me, you know when you drink a good scotch and then you jump to a bourbon, you go, oh, man, that's just too sweet for me. But that's what a good old American bourbon does. Straight whiskey, nice and sweet, corn flavored, light char, simple and smooth, and um, quite delicious. Wonderful. All right. Um... Why don't I then go back to the presentation? We'll uh, go through a, a few more slides and then we'll uh, turn it back over to Tiffany once um, to make the first drink. So with that, let me, can everybody still see my slides hopefully? And all right, so this is a little bit of why automation. I think everybody is um, understanding why um, to reduce human error, you know, uh, basically uh, reduction of unplanned downtime, the cost of savings uh, gained uh, per year um, from unplanned outages. The, re the payback of adopting automation is typically, uh, you can see right there, it's like 667% in a five year, um, you know, to, get payback. So these are some of the reasons why people are adopting automation. Uh, and why are people turning to Ansible automation, right? Uh, so it works across the enterprise, across the, the various teams. Um, it's simple, it's powerful, and it's agentless. I think the agentless piece is is handy in the sense of, uh, you know, you don't have to install on these uh, various devices and um, simple in the sense that you can look at a YAML code and figure out what the automation is actually doing. All right, so what you wanna do is be, be able to enable your teams, right? You wanna be able to create uh, the playbooks and with uh, Ansible Automation Platform um, 2. Dot, I think the current version is 2.3. Um, they've kind of segregated in these three different uh, components, you know, right? So they want to make it easier to create, and that enables uh, more adoption as people, uh, teams um, create. Um, how to manage it, right? How to scale it. Um, to be able to, as people move out to the edge, have edge devices, you want to be able to put the automation close to where that is being executed. So that's the scale uh, portion. And then to be able to see uh, if you need to um, spin up more capacity, um, you know, maybe different times of the month or um, so that's, you know, tying these three pieces together and more consistent. All right, um, so I talked a little bit about uh, some of the tools that are inside the creation, um, trying to make it easier for teams to write um, automation. 
And so uh, with uh, AAP2, uh, they uh, came up with a um, some uh, very intuitive uh, content tools to help that. And then on the other side, the operation tools, right? They talk about the automation mesh and how that is going to be deployed. And like I said, you want to put you know, the mesh or the controllers out to where it's being executed. And then overall, you want to be able to have a visual on that. So, um, all right, some of the things in um, that are new. Uh, so RHEL um, Linux version 9 is supported. Um, also, Postgres uh, database 13 is now um, what is supported with RHEL 9. It also has some RPMs inside of uh, version 9 uh, packages that help in the um, deployment of uh, Ansible automation platform. And this is kind of what I talked about, right? You have your users um, that basically want to write the playbook. So just think of this, you know, kind of a continual stream and um, you have the very different uh, components of it, right? The operation to be able to, you know, control everything, see it in a single pane of glass, the execution, where is it being executed? Is it in the data center uh, in one of the various public clouds or close to the edge? So I have an example with a retail customer. They have, it's a franchise, it's um, a food um, chain. And basically they have all these edge devices at uh, each of the stores. And so they wanna be able to automate and update those. And so uh, we're looking at putting in um, Ansible to help uh, do that. And how we're gonna do that is uh, to deploy um, in different availability zones in the cloud. So it's near the store and uh, to be able to update those. All right, so we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the control uh, plane and how um, you want basically to see all these different components and um, the integration, the credentials, um, you know, in a single pane of glass, and that's the control plane. And then there's also the segregation of the automation uh, mesh. Again, you want these execution uh, environments close to where you want to execute those. All right, I'm going to um, go back to Tiffany at this point, and we're going to make our first uh, drink of the evening. And uh, we'll uh, start with that. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. I know, you know, again, I can't emphasize how much how much fun it can be to work and work and, and drink. So if you are behind the scenes, please take advantage of the kit that we sent you um, to get some sampling going on. So now that we went through the hard part of me teaching you how to taste, you've been tasting for your entire life, but tasting whiskey can be a little different. Uh, remember coating the mouth. Uh, refreshing it and tasting something different, we can move on to the next, which is one of my favorites, which is a rye, a nice spicy rye, uh, Clyde Mays. And we're gonna give it a nice little taste there. Again, a friend, again, a friend, I just want a quarter ounce there for you just to understand the profile that we're tasting because there is a difference. When it comes to whiskey, we wanna understand the style that makes us happy. And I spoke on bourbon earlier and I used the word sweeter because corn is sweet. We eat it throughout the year, especially during the holidays. It does give us a sweet uh, veggie flavor. But when we get to rye, rye has a bit of a different uh, profile. Rye, if I have any beer drinkers out there, rye is definitely along with hops when it comes to beer. And rye can be a little more spicier. When I don't mean spicy like pepper, I mean spicy like more of a cinnamon, um, more of a different uh, tingle to the palate. So I just poured some of the Clyde Maze. I just poured a quarter ounce there that I want you to taste before we make our old fashioned tonight. You get to choose and give it a smell. If you still have some of that earlier bourbon there, they taste entirely, they smell entirely different there. So when you give it a, a, a smell there, honestly, when I smell rye, I get more of a savory note. I get um, the smell more of a grassier note, much of a sweeter note there. So giving it a whip there again, my schnauzer is not all the way in there. I'm just taking an inhale because I want to use those notes here for you know the rest of my life. So just taking a nice inhale there, looking at the color like we did, and it's giving us a nice golden color there, which is really pretty. Um, and we're gonna give that a sip. Small sip there just to coat the mouth from the bourbon that we had earlier or the chips and salsa that we sent you. 
And then we take a nice sip there. Coating the mouth again. Letting that warm space hit. And I don't know about you friends, but there's almost like a pickling spice that comes through. There's almost like a, 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 a nice um, summer day that comes through. A very different flavor than the bourbon that we have. There's uh, a spice, like I said, and that spice can come when you think of pickling spices. I'm here in Atlanta. I'm in the here in the South. We pickle everything. Pickling spices have a lot of vinegar. They have a little bit of sugar. There's a bit of coriander that can be around. And not to say that they're pickling the rye, but rye does different things when it comes into fermentation and distillation. So there is a different kind of profile there. So if you're tasting the two side by side, again, I just went for a quarter ounce there. This may be exciting for you. Uh, this may be like, wow, this really works because the bourbon may be too sweet or the rye may be too much. So you want to be careful or also and also understand that these are two different profiles in the whiskey category. And that's the fun part about making whiskey cocktails or even sipping whiskey on the rocks is understanding the difference between what a corn whiskey do, a straight whiskey could do versus a rye whiskey when it touches sugar, when it touches lemon, uh, when it touches ginger ale or ginger beer or whenever we're doing, you know, our, our fun things during the holidays. These two profiles do some things. We've got one more to hey, take. Tiffany? Yes. I was just going to ask, uh, you, you mentioned you're going to touch on what happens when you add water or like if you uh, yes. put in a, an ice cube yes. as well. Yes, thanks, Mike. So if you're still sitting with me, I just want to just hold on to not too much of them. If you have a little bit more there, I'm going to pour a little bit of rye into my glass as we just had some of that. And I, I had some bourbon there pouring a little neat of that. I have my water bottle because, you know, we keep our water bottles nearby. I'm just going to add a drop of water. We're not trying to dilute this. We're just trying to just add a little water. What happens with whiskey touches water because whiskey is made with a lot of water, diluted with water, cooked with water. Uh, the water changes things, not just dilution, my friends. Like usually we get a, a grab of a drink and we say light ice or uh, don't dilute my drink, but a bit of water on a neat spirit does some things. So I'm just going to drop uh, a nice small pour here of, on the rye. If you had the rye with me, I'm going to give it a nice little taste there. I just poured a little bit of the rye uh, and water together, giving it a mix. And I'm going to do the same thing for my bourbon. Just a nice spin there. That's probably the same, not equal parts, but maybe shy of a quarter ounce there. And you can smell the nose and some things have happened. This thing has opened up completely the way a wine would do, but it's seen water and the molecules of whiskey when they're first created and bottled and aged, we do cut it with water and toss it in a barrel and bottle it. But when it sees water, it's excited. It opens up again. But then it shrinks back in. Whiskey's molecules can just grab that water back and hold it back tight. So if you're tasting with me, give the rye or the bourbon a taste since the water's been added. And there's also almost a floral note that comes out. We're seeing the delicate side of the oak barrel come through. Definitely on the rye there and on the bourbon. Just in the nose, I don't even have to sip it. On the nose there, it's a lot more clean and, and, and approachable than it was in the beginning. It was straight uh, barrel. So a single barrel only sees one barrel and actually get more of the oak here than I do on the rye. Softer, smoother. It softens it on some age and almost drier on the bourbon. You're almost getting a little bit more of a, I hate to say, a day whiskey style uh, where you want to put that with some lemon um, and brighten it up a tad. Um, with the rye, we're still keeping those savory notes, a, bit of, a little bit of spice, yet the character is still there. And of course, the color has shifted, but the nose and the approachability is definitely different. Wonderful. All right. No, I, um, 
I typically with uh, my whiskeys or whatever, I'll do a little bit of water or a uh, big uh, square uh, ice cube and it slowly yeah. kind of releases into it. So yeah, some people good. like it neat. Um, I uh, prefer a little water in mine. So yeah, a little water goes a long way, literally. Yes, for <laughs> sure. Um, all right, let me go back. Uh, we'll cover. <clears throat> Can everybody see my screen again? OK. Um, so this was announced at Ansible um, Fest, um, I think was in September. And so um, basically with event driven, as I stated, it's it's moving from that mindset of being reactive to being proactive, right? So you want to build automation with the intent of having it, you know, self healing fix itself. And this is available now in uh, Ansible automation platform. Um, like I said, um, in GA, I believe uh, Tech 3 or 2.3 is uh, now out. And so a lot of these features and functionalities are present today. So really, it's uh, you want to make it highly scalable, flexible, right? And you're going to take um, similar to what, um, if anybody's familiar and uses Insight, where Insight uh, monitors your current Linux environment and is able to uh, do some predictive analytics based on other, um, you know, vulnerabilities, and it will actually generate a uh, YAML uh, Ansible playbook to execute. So that's taking um, this event driven is, is similar in the sense of like it could be on your Kafka environment, you know, it could be in your OpenShift environment, right? You're you're building out a process to, you know, proactively um, execute these automations and basically freeing up more time uh, from your uh, resources. All right, so we talked about, you know, becoming, you know, the components this is very similar to, you know, uh, what we've talked about before, the, the speed, right? Uh, everybody wants to reduce the number of manual steps. Um, consistency, uh, anytime you can be consistent and drive out, you know, errors, that's gonna help ensure your resilience. And basically, uh, to transform your IT department, you have to um, innovate, right? So uh, by freeing up some of those resources, you'll be able to have them focus on more innovative tasks. And automation is a, a big tool in that. All right. Um, and where to get started with this event-driven uh, Ansible? The one of the, uh, the ones that uh, we've been doing for quite a while. It, it talked about the service ticket augmentation. Uh, we have an integration I'll show on the next slide into ServiceNow, but if you don't have that as your ITSM, uh, we, you know, with Ansible, the nice thing about that is any open API it can write to. So um, that is an opportunity, and uh, we see a lot of p uh, companies take advantage of that to build that integration uh, automation into your service ticket. So then it tracks, you know, approvals and validation, and really it's taking that to the next level. Not just, you know, on your, you know, your infrastructure. It can be your your edge nodes, as the example I gave earlier with the um, the retail um, food. Um, where they're updating the point of sale um, information uh, at a quicker, right? So you want the remediation, um, you know, any drift issues. I have some customers that start out in just backing up the config until they get comfortable, and then they're able then to start writing um, playbooks to actually make changes. And that's a lot in the net uh, in the network space where I have that. And then overall, you want to be able to have consistent uh, user management. Um, that, you know, the role based access, right? And so how did they do that with LDAP, LDAP integration? And um, that just makes it easier to use and consume, right? All right, this is what I mentioned. We do have a demo on uh, our integration into ServiceNow. So um, at the end, if there, if this piques uh, interest, um, uh, please let me know and I can schedule a uh, demo for you. Um, and really, it's a very powerful tool as, and again, if you don't have a service now or Remedy or some other ITSM, uh, we can integrate into that as well. But um, we do have service now since it is a large uh, market share. So that's an opportunity for us to engage on. Um, you know, this the, the different tiers basically uh, is very similar to building a um, 
uh, a decision um, matrix and basically how it passes through and it, it really drives um, the Ansible, um, you know, the decision tier, you know, basically it could be metrics driven, it can be a management uh, inter, um, interface, basically making the decision to then push it out to uh, execution mode. So uh, the, one of the examples is the uh, ServiceNow ticket update, right? So um, here's a sample of basically, you know, kind of the, it's a, like a Venn diagram where you have it writes, it does a check and it won't proceed until that, you know, uh, correct parameter is passed and then moves on. So um, this is a very uh, event uh, engine based and um, we can help you kind of walk through and design this since it's a little more complex than your standard automation. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna go back to Tiffany and Tiffany, why don't you, we're getting, uh, we just have a few more um, kind of slides to walk through. So maybe um, we could make uh, the cocktail uh, or finish um, on those. Absolutely. No, I'm glad to be a part of the presentation. So thanks, Mike, for uh, knocking out what you can and me squeezing in my work. I feel like we're a complete team right now. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I do. I mean, I love it. I, I, I love, we love teaming up with Red Hat and we love that. You all love to have work and play at the same time. It's a work like balance. So anytime I get to see uh, any Red Hat presentations, I, I love it. Um, sometimes I'm, I'm left at the end or the beginning, but to be a part makes me happy. Um, the final whiskey, just a brand there. I'm gonna show the final whiskey, give it a taste. And then if that's okay, Mike, should I go ahead and make the cocktail at this moment? Or would you like me to close out with the cocktail? I don't wanna no, I think, uh, you know, for this last piece, it's really about how we're going to help, you know, we can help enable. So I think to now would be, you know, they can uh, enjoy the cocktail through these last few slides would be um, beneficial. Fantastic. I think we deserve it. Yeah. Yeah. So the final yes. whiskey there is an Irish whiskey, you know, Irish whiskey. Uh, I am not an Irish woman, but I definitely have always loved Irish whiskey since my first time of sipping whiskey because it was a softer uh, approach is uh, Irish whiskey seen as one of one of the sweetest whiskeys and the taste that we gave you there. Um, it sits in a port cast, port meaning um, something, a sweet wine from Portugal. So this whiskey, unlike the other two whiskeys we tasted earlier, we're sitting in a charred whiskey barrel, I mean a charred barrel for months, but this beautiful Irish whiskey has been sitting in um, a port wine barrel. So we're getting the nuance of wine and whiskey. And if you can see through the bottle, it's a lot more delicate and more golden, giving it less age, but more fruity and sweet notes. And I think it's absolutely fabulous to showcase the cocktail that I want to show you, which is the classic old fashioned. The classic old fashioned we've seen on every, pretty much every menu with the old fashioned to us, cocktail gurus like myself is the first cocktail ever documented, meaning we saw something that was made with a spirit, sugar, um, a water, and a bitter. And bitter could have been anything, and water could have been anything from salt water to boiled water to ice cubes. Um, and spirit could have been any spirit like we have tonight, um, and, and, and then um, uh, blending that in together with a sugar. And sugar could have been anything from honey to mead to brown sugar to agave. So I want to make one of my favorite cocktails and the classic of all classics and something sippable throughout the evening and hopefully the holiday, the old fashioned. So um, in my cocktail beaker or whatever you want to use at home, I'm using brown sugar. I'm using brown sugar because I think a lot of whiskey notes are brown sugar, not white sugar for baking, but brown sugar is really what's happening while that whiskey sitting in a barrel. Um, while it's sitting in a barrel, if you've ever been on a distillery tour, you can see the barrel has a little bit of almost sap coming through and that almost smells and tastes like brown sugar. So I've used about two and a half uh, bar spoons of brown sugar there in the bottom of my mixing glass. And I'm using some bitters. We've seen this bottle all over. Maybe it's been at your grandma or grandpa's house. Maybe it's been at your favorite bar. Maybe it's at your bar right now. But Angostura bitters is the uh, solid go-to right there, the holy grail of what bitters uh, originally taste like back in the day. And bitters does not make your drink bitter. 
it more so makes your uh, cocktail have a little more balance and, and flavoring. Inside of a bitters bottle, it's got some cinnamon and some char bark and anise and clove, all things coming from the Caribbean and West Africa that really give like a salt and pepper, a little attitude. One of my friends calls bitters the hot sauce of a cocktail. So I'm just going to drop about four drops of that onto my sugar. I'm flipping my bottle completely upside down. Nothing's coming out, so don't worry. If one or two dribbles happen, don't worry. It won't mess up the cocktail. We're not baking. We're making a drink. So we're going to do four drops there. Um, likely would do a nice ketchup bottle or hot sauce <laughs> there just to make sure we get all those drops. Bitters also has alcohol, my friends, it's a 44.7 proof, but it does give those flavor uh, touches that we really love when it comes to a good classic old fashioned or cocktail. And I just made that, and uh, I put that into my brown sugar. I'm kind of blending that, making it like a, a sand of sorts, letting the brown sugar absorb my bitters. If you don't want to use brown sugar, you want to use agave or molasses or um, uh, honey, whatever you please, it's fine. I just want you to have a sweetener that goes with that. Bitter loves sweet, bitter loves spicy, and bitter loves um, a little savory note. So I've made a little bit of paste there on the bottom, and we've got a choice. So if you get a chance to make this thing uh, later on tonight or tomorrow for your friends, at least you know how to balance it out. I think I want to choose, I don't know, um, I'm going to go with the Irish whiskey since we didn't taste it yet. I want to go there. This small bottle is shy of two ounces, 1.6 ounces. I'm going to pour that all the way inside of my uh, cocktail mixer. Not often we need to pour an entire mini during a meeting. I mean, I don't know if y'all are doing it, but you shouldn't be. But hey, we're doing it right now. <laughs> and I'm incorporating that whiskey with that beautiful paste that I have, brown sugar and bitters. I'm just blending the two so the sugar can dilute a tad because after that dilution happens, I'm going to add a few pieces of ice to chill it out. And the ice is not only there to cool my cocktail, the ice is there to dilute my cocktail. Dilution is very important when it comes to cocktail making. The way a chef needs fire to cook, a bartender needs the same thing when it comes to ice. We need dilution. That whiskey was warm. The brown sugar was warm. The bitters was warm. And yes, we don't want to uh, water our cocktail. Um, we want, as we taste it, when we taste those whiskeys meat, we see what happens when it touches water. So I'm just giving it a nice good stir, about 20 or 30 seconds. Simple ingredients. We're not muddling an orange or a cherry inside. We're making a classic 1887 old fashioned, which is sugar, bitters, water, and spirits. That nice and cold there. But, Tiffany, I was just going to make a comment on um, I do like uh, Canadian whiskey as well, which it tends to be a little sweeter. Yeah. But then you're also seeing a huge influx on Japanese whiskeys. And um, it's interesting to see like how long their age also, um, I think, um, helps with how smooth it is. Like the longer it's, it seems to be aged, uh, you know, obviously it, it, it's, I think, a little smoother. So those are all different uh, factors in uh, deciding what kind of whiskey you're going to make with your old fashioned. Indeed. And I'm glad you said that. Our palettes are personal friends. So what you like is what you like. And even stepping out of the whiskey category, we're seeing tequila old fashions, we're seeing cognac old fashions, yep. we're seeing rum old fashions. Really, we're just trying to grab the nuance of the spirit that we love and bring it into the classic form of an old fashioned, which is, again, that sugar and that bitter um, and, and a little bit of water in our favorite spirit. Um, yes, Canadian whiskey, just like Irish whiskey, which I chose, can be a little more sweeter because it's not aged so long. Japanese whiskey doesn't have the same water. Japan does not have the same water as Kentucky. So they're diluting it in a different, um, a different form. So that was a great, great note there. Um, I am pulling out my big um, rocks glass there. And um, we always want a nice piece of dense ice. I've got, you know, we buy those nice molds for a good reason. Yeah. The holidays are coming, so we know these are great gifts. But I've got a nice dense piece of ice, and 
we're not just using Jin's eyes to show off. I mean, we are, but we're not just using it to show off. We're really doing it so you want this cocktail to sip slowly. And it's kind of like when you're cooking a nice, good uh, piece of meat, slow and low is the way to go. And we want that to happen with our old fashioned. That was a very spirit forward cocktail. You saw me pour the entire content of that bottle with just sugar and bitter. So we want to make sure that it definitely sips slower. And so I'm just going to pour that over my nice dense rock. I've got a nice, nice sphere there. Of course, it looks great to show off for our friends, but that sphere is going to melt slowly so that I can continue to enjoy those notes of the whiskey that I, that I love and that brown sugar and the bitters will carry on through. You can choose to garnish it with the cherry, anise, cinnamon, set it on fire, not the glass or yourself, but set the glass, give it a nice little smoke, or slice a lemon or orange on top to give a smell and fragrance to it. One thing I love about making great cocktails is that it's all of our sensories, not just smell and taste, but it's also the look and the feel. So to you all, uh, to the close of your year and in your Q4, thanks for having me and cheers. Wonderful, cheers. I didn't uh, get the kit, but I made um, my friend turn me on to Black Manhattans. So basically using whiskey rye and a dark uh, vermouth. Um, so it's a dark vermouth. And um, I did try to talk my wife into buying the refrigerator that makes those large cubes, but she said I was crazy. So <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you know, you just have to keep rubbing it in, you know. In the meantime, until you woo her to get that refrigerator, grab a couple of molds and just mark your place yeah. in the freezer for fun ice. Yeah. I actually exactly. have, in my house, I actually, I mean, I'm in the industry, but I keep, yes, I have a wine cooler for those large bottles, but um, I have a few friends that love great craft beers. I live next to two distilleries and I keep beer in the fridge, but I keep really fun ice in the freezer. So maybe you can talk her into a nice uh, small yeah. freezer from uh, Lowe's for way less okay. price than the fridge. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I appreciate that. Hopefully everybody's enjoying their, I do love an old fashioned. I know some of the high end whiskey places also do like the smoker to get that kind of that age, the oak taste out when they, you know, kind of put it in a, a chamber. Plus, it's also pretty, uh, everybody looks and turns their head when they bring out this smoker to set at your table for this drink, you know, so it's kind of a, um, you know, a whole show, I guess, when you're going to experience that. For sure. So, and right. if you want to do that at home, by all means, there's some really fun gadgets at home that make it super easy. You can add apple chips, mesquite chips to a very small vessel and soak them right at home for, for, for your own showcase. So um, there's there's no limit to showing off at home uh, when you want to make a great old fashioned. So cheers. <laughs> Wonderful. OK, so uh, I hope everybody can enjoy their uh, old fashioned as we kind of finish up towards the end of this. Um, I do want to thank our partnership with uh, Red Hat. Um, it's been a wonderful partnership with them um, and to help enable us um, with um, all this technology and uh, it's like I said a great partnership also cocktail guru we've done many um, webinars uh, and I greatly appreciate uh, Tiffany uh, taking time today to uh, work with us through this it's uh, been wonderful absolute pleasure um, with with that I want to cover uh, a few things that we have here at Crossville that um, hopefully uh, trigger something uh, with you we have what we call these uh, launch pads and we try to do small medium large shirt sizes to and this is really just to get um, the conversation when we start doing the scoping part what we you know you know what it is that you're looking to uh, help with deployment so uh, we have one just around the um, you know basically enabling it you know in the standard two week it you know kind of stands it up all the way to the enterprise and it really makes it a center of excellence um, with automation and build out the redundancy and um, being able to deploy it that way so we do see uh, we do have one around the network automation launch pad because we are seeing a lot of growth in this area and one of the things i think uh, that is very valuable is a lot of the isds um, the Cisco's, they actually uh, produce their own content um, and we're seeing quite a bit of adoption in the network space. So these are 
uh, you know, things that um, will help with the conversation when we get down to the, the scoping or statement of work with you. Um, so as far as uh, other things that um, we can uh, help with our assessments to kind of figure out where you're at today and where you want to be with your automation platform or any of the other pillars that we focus on, we can uh, come in and, and do a uh, assessment. I've talked a little bit about the launch pads to do a statement of work. Uh, one of the big areas too, I think, uh, for people to uh, dip their toes in is doing a funded POC. Um, so we uh, can come in basically and for a short engagement, work on success criteria and be able to, you know, stand up uh, Ansible automation and have you test it for typically I've seen it uh, 30 days or 60 at the longest to, you know, work through your use cases and validate that that's going to be the right solution. And lastly, we can do workshops, custom workshops for you and um, work with your team to do that. Uh, again, this material will be uh, sent out afterwards along with the recording. Uh, we also have, uh, feel free to go to the link uh, uh, at Red Hat for additional information on Ansible. But um, at this point, uh, are there any questions? I don't see any in the chat. Any, anybody feel free to, you know, A, come off, to, uh, come off the mute and turn your camera on and Say hey, how your drink is. Uh, any questions in regards to that? Tiffany's here to answer any questions you may have around um, the different whiskeys, drinks, comments. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, or just enjoy and cheers. Yeah. All right. I'm just seeing if there are any chats. Um, all right. So let's see. Uh, thanks, Sean, for the. Comments. Um, all right, I uh, will uh, keep that in mind uh, when making uh, my Manhattan. But um, I'm glad everybody had a chance to enjoy some great whiskey and hopefully something uh, triggered along with the presentation. Um, we greatly appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule to join us today. And um, if uh, you want to follow up with Crossvale and get more information, you can go to sales at crossvale.com. Again, my name is Mike Cohorst, and uh, we will send out the presentation uh, afterwards. So greatly appreciate your time. Happy holidays, everyone. Tiffany, thanks again. Uh, Laura, uh, thanks for uh, making this happen. So thanks, everyone.